I think there are three reasons why growth as measured in the economy through the gross domestic product is creating an unquiet. The first because it is justifying so much destruction of society and the planet. Second, especially from socially excluded groups like women. It's become, becoming very clear that it defines as production only commodified production. So if I grow good food and have good nutrition and have a livelihood, it's not contributing to growth. When I start to grow BT cotton, I'm contributing to growth, but in the process I'm committing suicide and that doesn't count. So there's too much left out. And the, uh, this wonderful uh, f fellow feminist from New Zealand who was a uh, parliamentarian, very young, and every time she'd ask for money for women and children, she'd be told there isn't enough money. And then they'd ask for the next bomber uh, or they'd ask for the next defense expansion and there was always money. So she said, how come there's always money? for destructive things and never money for taking care of society. So she wrote a wonderful book called If Women Counted, both the fact that if women were counted, but if they were doing the counting, because a lot depends on how you measure and what you measure. She tracked all the way down to national accounting systems, which basically say, if you produce what you consume, which means if you are sustainable and you live in cycles of renewal, that production doesn't count. So when you sell what you produce, you're contributing to growth. And when you buy what you need, you're contributing to growth. And that's why we've got this amazing situation where global trade says 200 billion added. All you did was trash two economies and everyone's importing and everyone's exporting. It's a way to not just be blind to sustainability, but to be blind to production and producers. And the third reason, of course, is the externalities are now outstripping growth. The Chinese studies have clearly shown that China would have a negative growth today. Every specific study I've done, whether it was for Chipko, it was the Dune Valley mining study, or coastal ecosystem damage through industrial aquaculture, the external externalities are 10 times higher than the financial profits that are generated by a destructive activity and what we are witnessing with Jammu and Kashmir floods, what we witnessed in Uttarakhand last year, these are absolutely unprecedented disasters. The shape they're taking, the scale they're uh, being destructive at, uh, and I think we need to ask the question of when will we start internalizing the destruction both of ecosystems and nature as well as destruction of societies as livable places. When that tragic rape of Nirbhai took place, I wrote an essay saying this was an externality of taking people off the land, throwing them into cities, brutalizing them, and then all they have left is brutalize others. And we have to take these processes into account, the social decay as well as the ecological decay. Yes, it's true that while the flood damage should be counted as a negative externality, all the work that will get done in building new bridges, all of the relief work will be added to a GDP accounting system. And that's just bad accounting. We wouldn't be having farmer suicides if we were doing true accounting uh, because the cost to farmers would be built into it. Right now is the trade in seed that is reflected and the gross income. But of course gross flows of financial transactions can leave people poorer and the debt of our agrarian economy is an example, which is why we've now started to calculate health per acre in terms of the nutritional benefits of ecological farming and we will be releasing a new report called Wealth Per Acre because wealth is well-being. And how is a system of production increasing or decreasing well-being? The figures are very clear. It's trillions and trillions of dollars of negative externalities with chemical industrial agriculture and billions of benefit, dollars of benefits through ecological farming. These are the new systems we'll have to study. I think the very big problem with 
growth and its blindness is its very nature is to deny the existence of systems. Yeah? It, it blinds us to an economic system and replaces a number. It blinds us to distribution of power in society. It blinds us to the ecological impact. It blinds us to decay in society and decay in values. I think 20 years ago, India was at a position where we had started to realize that development paths that only looked at growth and revenues uh, were creating huge problems. I think the tragedy of the last 20 years has been that we got globalization, we got the World Trade Organization, which in effect became a system of outsourcing costs. So environmental costs were outsourced, all aluminium came to India, bauxite mining came to India, mining of iron ore and steel plants came to India, coal mining came to India, and we were expected to carry the ecological burden of a global production system. But there was also outsourcing in the software economy, the outsourcing of everything that is costly at the level of society or at the level of the environment. And what that outsourcing has done is we now have the West maintaining their very high levels of consumption but having no environmental pollution. Even more importantly, I get invited by Angela Merkel to discuss the need to shift from GDP to well-being, but our government has now taken it on itself to say we must f make all the errors of the West. The only problem is in the last round of colonization, India didn't have a colony. We became a colony, we didn't have a colony. In today's new colonization through outsourcing of the globalized economy, there is no place for us to outsource to except our own people. And that's why the tribal areas are under such unrest, because we've turned them into a colony. And I think this juncture where we've taken the worst of the world and said, this is our growth parameter, and we need growth because we've got to catch up with them. There is no way you can catch up with a collapsing system. The only thing you can do is be wise, recognize the system is collapsing, and choose another path. I, I think the reason the third curve is such an important book for India at this point is because it's a wake-up call. You are showing that this chasing of limitless growth on a limited planet and even more limited India with our 1.2 billion people and very little resources, there is no place for us to enlarge our ecological footprint without either getting rid of 80% people, which would be genocide and a total violation of human rights and democracy, or bring ourselves to social ecological collapse. The fact that you said the basic things about what's going on with the economy, it's so important because these discussions of growth and the fact that Chasing a growth that's eating up its very foundations, whether the foundations of nature or the faces of foundations in culture and society, can only bring collapse. And the connection of the dots really now has to be taking every incident and in an honest way connecting it to the growth paradigm, whether it be violence against women or it be these new disasters, which have nothing natural about them because they're way beyond the normal phenomena. You know, every normal phenomena has an aberration of, okay, minus plus 20%. When you start to go 500% off, you need to say something's different. And if year after year there's a 500% off event, then you need to start looking at the pattern. What you've done with the third curve is look at the patterns. Growth is very much a disease, and I would say it's first a mental disease. Because for intelligent human beings who are connected with the living earth, who are part of living societies, to take all that experience, shut it out, put faith in a number which reflects nothing reliable except the appropriation of the wealth of a society by a handful of people, there it is a very good and very reliable number, which is why we now have oligarchs of a scale we've never, this society has never seen, but it is 
a mental, it begins with a mental sickness to replace reality with a number. The second reason it is a sickness and a disease is because it is become a very severe cancerous disease on the planet and it's costing us our very future because if we don't wake up, and we keep extrapolating the kind of disasters and the levels at which they're increasing and their frequency, I think we can see that within a century we will make this planet uninhabitable for our species. Other species might thrive, but not the humans. And the third reason why it has become a disease is it is a social disease. In these last 10 years of India reducing its mindset to it, everything is about money, let me grab money in whatever we can, I have seen families throwing out parents because for them parents mattered less and the home where they grew up matters less. It's now property and how much they can grab. I have seen people brutalizing each other where we could be out in the middle of the night and never have to think of the fact that we were young girls. I think that social decay is something we really need to look at because if we don't arrest it in time you know my first book green revolution my second my book on earth democracy my book on india divided are all about how an economic system based on this false measure of growth it tears apart the fabric of society and when that fabric of society is torn apart then that society based on diversity and the ability to live with all of the pluralism that India is, now starts to become fertile ground for breeding intolerance, which ends up becoming political capital. So a negative externality of the growth paradigm as a disease creates social diseases, which then feed a system to keep people in power through divide and rule, while they rape the earth more, and while they destroy society more. Now that vicious cycle of constantly increasing deprivation is what we need to break. And we need to break it at a time where we can see that that disease of growth is becoming a disease for democracy too. It's not allowing democracy to function in a wholesome way because every time a tribal rises and says, leave my mountain alone, leave this area alone, the interests who know they can make billions out of this use the state to crush the protests. And that death of democracy means eventually growth creates the political disease of dictatorship. Growth and the GDP as measure of growth has become a fundamentalist ideology. And it is breeding intolerance against any other philosophy, any other way of thinking, just like any fundamentalism creates intolerance. And it's feeding on three things. First, of course, the illusions in the head. Second, the fact that those illusions are working very well for a tiny minority on the top. But third, most importantly, false promises are sold to the public. If there's growth in the economy, you're going to have more. No, if there's growth in the economy which is ecologically destructive, the farmer and the tribal will lose their land, which is why blood has been shed in this country over the issue of land grab. It's not that everyone gets more, because this growth is based on eating the very entrails of society, and in that process, the most vulnerable are the ones who are sacrificed. Well, I think in 2008, the bubble based on artificial maintenance of growth through fictitious categories like derivatives and securitization, that bubble had already burst. I think the bubble of energy has also burst because let's not forget that everything that's growing wrong in the Middle East is the political military externality of an oil-centered economy. And meantime, Within the United States, there's this chasing of gas and fracking, and every community is losing their basic rights to live in peace, to live with environmental laws, because around the time when Iraq was invaded, a law was passed that fracking would not have to obey water laws and the Clean Water Act. 
So the bubbles are bursting. I think the false idea of growth in agriculture, as it's been measured, um, and you know, a very eminent gentleman of this society said, we've got to increase growth in agriculture, and the way to do it is remove, reduce the d denominator, which is farmers. Yeah? So you can just automatically increase growth in agriculture by writing off half your farmers and say, now we have this much per capita growth. That kind of thinking is ignoring the fact that the, the bubble of growth has already burst in our food system. Whether you look at the ecological capital of our soils, they're in crisis, look at water, look at the unstable climate, and look at biodiversity. But we have also come to a very vulnerable point of the bubble bursting at the nutritional end, because after all, food is supposed to be about nourishment. If a country has every fourth in member of its society hungry, and if every second child, which is the food future of our society, is malnourished, stunted, wasted, that's a bubble that's burst. We're just not seeing it. I totally agree with you. I face it all the time in the food and agriculture scene, where the very models that have given us the crisis in the name of growth are today saying, oh, we'll now bring you GMO seeds, we'll now bring you biofortification and genetically engineered bananas and golden rice with vitamin A. Um, they even talked about how they'll save Indian women from dying in childbirth by putting some iron genes into banana, which would still be about 7,000% less efficient than iron-rich foods that we have in our diversity. And those who've made it in growth, while it is true, that GDP as a measure was created for state intervention. By the time it had been used, um, those who realized this is very useful for concentrating profits wouldn't give it up. And now there is an addiction. Just as much as chemicals that were used for war during the wars were then changed into agrochemicals which are today poisoning our food systems. And now the same companies are bringing us GMOs. So a system that has manipulated the human mind, manipulated policy, manipulated the entire political and economic system is not going to give up that manipulation in a hurry till people wake up to these extremely false fundamentalist beliefs and rise to shaping paradigms that work for the earth and work for people. You're very right that it's under huge assault. I don't think it's being wiped out because I think there is both resistance and resilience. And I think our challenge really is to take these words that just get floated around and used. Vasudeva Kutumkam, what does it mean? Live on the earth as a family. What does that mean? You've got to put limits on your grabbing. You've got to put limits on your growth in this false measure of financial terms. Um, I think we've got to go deep into our shared civilizational roots of organizing our minds, our intellectual frameworks, and our life's practices in a way that we can now build a contemporary model that works for the youth who are being made to for chase false dreams. Uh, I, I watch gangs of young unemployed men they were made to believe, forget your village. But there's no place for them in the city either. And I think we really need to reconnect the two deep crises, the ecological crisis we face and the economic crisis of unemployment. And connect the two from growth destroying the planet to new kinds of creative work generating employment and rejuvenating the planet. That's where we must have more activities. That's where the growth of nature becomes the measure of how well you're doing. Growth of community and its values becomes the measure. And these debates are taking place everywhere and I think we, I'm so grateful that you, with your book, had the courage to write about a subject where fossilized econom economists were stuck with theories of 90 years ago, 
and curves. You know, I did physics. I did uh, foundations of quantum theory for my PhD. And eco economics uh, graduates would come and see my books on the von Neumann theorem. He said, oh, you studied economics. I said, no, 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 it went from physics. All you've done is adopt every equation and don't even know what it means anymore. And that's the problem. The reason your friends from technology institutes understand this is we are taught to think in terms of processes and systems. You can't build a working system that's technological without knowing how it works. But in economics, you can borrow from math and physics graphs, and they never have to be verified against reality. Never. And I think every new discussion on the subject will do what Thomas Kuhn told us happens. The old paradigms don't give way because those who pushed it are now convinced. They never get convinced because they are locked in their paradigm. Old paradigms give way when new paradigms emerge that have more power and have more conviction and are able to mobilize more people.